this time, let's start with uh, opening for questions to the floor. There was some reactions during the presentation, so please share your questions if you have them. Or is everyone too tired <laughs> to question? <laughs> Lucky me, then it will be me. <laughs> um, I would like to, to start because there s uh, your uh, presentations were all so different. I was really, I mean, there are common threads, of course, but I was really struggling to find one question for everyone. So it will be a little bit different. I would like to first ask Wolfgang to elaborate a little bit more on how does improving access to electricity actually contribute to conservation and restoration that we've been talking so much about in the last two days. Well, I gave some examples during the presentation. Um, I mentioned the city of Saar in, in Chad. And there are many more um, kind of projects and examples like this. Uh, let me um, tell you about one, an, a customer that we have in Senegal. He is a farmer. He grew up in the village and went to the city then to earn money there. But he missed his family and came back to the village to become a farmer. The first thing he did was he bought a diesel generator to, to pump uh, water uh, to irrigate his, his fields. Then he does all the work, and then when he has harvested the, the, the fruits, 50% of it just goes to waste because there's no cool chain. This is a completely insane kind of business model, and, uh, but it's easy to, to solve because uh, we offer um, a solar pump to the customer. In the past, he had to, to spend uh, 270 euros every month for diesel. And uh, then has this, uh, this food loss rate <laughs> of 50%. And we offer him a solar pump, which costs him 200 euros every month. And after three years, it's his pump. And then we also put the, co uh, the cool container next to it. And then uh, the food loss rate goes down to just a few percent only. No, and uh, there is value, you can increase the income times three of this farmer. And I mean, this is real impact that you can, that you can see, that you can touch, that you can, uh, yeah, that, that you can look at. And uh, I'm always wondering why we are talking so much about uh, so complex things, uh, about ESG and uh, paperless offices and these kind of things that have no impact, while it's so easy to really do impact locally with people and I mean, you, you do the same, you know, and uh, I think we talk about the wrong things uh, too often and um, we have to uh, to refocus on the real things. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered your, your question, but uh, I tried at least. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, sorry. I keep messing up the instructions uh, from the technical team. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Wolfgang. Uh, my next question to Hoslo, since he's sitting uh, next to you, would be, it's a question that we've asked a lot of the speakers, but I'm sure your perspective will bring additional uh, insight. How, because you work a lot with local communities and farmers on the ground. How do you build trust on the ground level when working with them? How do I build trust? By being there all the time. Mm. I'm just there. They see me on a daily basis. Uh, they know I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> if it's then yeah, they know that I'm not going anywhere. Uh, it's a question that, okay, my wife and child misses me when I'm in the bush. But it's a, it's a <laughs> question that, you know, if I'm there constantly and I'm constantly you know, in making meetings there, making sure that everybody's online and what we're going to do. And at the same time, all my staff is local. Yeah, all the staff is local. Not one outsider besides me. Yeah. So that's how you build trust. Because those people are also there every time. When I'm away, they're also there. And they're in charge. See, my job is not to run the whole thing. My job is to find people to do the work locally to f you know, get everything done. Yeah? I have also a life. 
Uh, I can be also in many different countries, but it's also a question that I also have to rely on my staff to be the key point. They should be here, and not me talking. Usually they are here than me talking, because I'm usually so far away from conferences that it's like there's no point for me to come, be, come here. You know, my investors are coming from Namibia itself. You know, all the organizations that I need money for are actually from there. You know, it's very difficult to explain to a Swiss person or Swiss bank you know, why you should start a project in Namibia. You know, I can ask the African Development Bank why we should do a project in Namibia. You know, I can ask institutions in Namibia and ask them to do, do those projects. But for here, you know, we have this very interesting uh, uh, mechanism right now that everybody wants to do environmental projects. Everybody wants to do tree planting projects. Everybody wants to say, you know, do carbon offsetting projects. But the question is, like, what is your connection? The, the people that I want to invest in my project uh, for tree planting are 25 million trees, are actually people who are from the paper industry, <coughs> who actually take out the trees to make paper. Those are the kind of clients that I want. I want them to be able to say, we have put back some trees that we took out in, for the paper industry. I don't want gas and energy companies to come and invest money in there and just get the carbon credits. There has to be a, a connection between the work on the field and the work on who's going to buy those credits as well. There has to be some feeling behind of it. That's why I approach the paper industry com companies rather than anybody else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Can we comment on the same question? Of course. Yeah. Fully agree, only very quickly. And I think it's, it's, a, fine, it's a fine balance between uh, being able to move quick and at the same time not destroying the trust that you build by being very close to the people on the side. Uh, we had the challenge of, um, and we still have the challenge, of being able to match the funding as it comes in and the scouting activities on the land, on the projects themselves. Because if you over you need to promise something so that you can be the first um, uh, choice of the people that are actually selling the land at the same time, you need to deliver relatively quickly because then you can very easily lose the trust. And of course, all the other reasons that you mentioned, this is, uh, th this is absolutely, absolutely right. Thank you. Um, Kosti, you can hold the microphone. Sure. I'm, I might as well uh, proceed with the next question to you. Can you um, elaborate a little bit more on the advantages of this cooperative model of impact investment um, as compared to the more traditional models of impact investment? Yes, I think that as I said during my presentation, we feel that this is an innovative approach. Right, and as I said, in the group, in the sister companies, the Dutch entity is for institutional investors, so that's more straightforward. So the cooperative is is um, is given the possibility to people, to the retail investor or to the individual. There are a lot of people that are doing that more as a as a movement. They're inspired. They want to do something for the environment, but not necessarily uh, do philanthropy. And and so that was a that was a gap that was missing from the market. And we thought that this is the best way to approach it. The common denominator of all the structures that we have in the group is exactly the same activity. It's a generation forest. We buy the land. We reforest in this special way that I explained before. It's just the structuring. The innovation is on the structuring. And of course, there are also we can uh, involve corporates going forward. On the one side, you have corporates in Europe, in the Western world, that want to sequester their CO2. A lot of them are afraid to do the one or the other project that are, you know, they're coming up like mushrooms right now. Uh, whatever <laughs> relates to CO2, you see crazy stuff around. Uh, so they, they are concerned with, with reputational risks. So they would rather go to an offer like ours, where they feel more comfortable that this is really impactful, that is this nature-based solution uh, uh, driven with the right social impact as well. Now, that would be the whole retail investors, the individuals would be excluded from such strategies. So the cooperative, the Genossenschaft in Germany is providing this possibility and that's we feel that it's a very new model and it's not starting now. I think the fact that we got 6,000 individuals 
uh, from 30 countries uh, that are f fully inspired and not with so much advertisement. It was more a mouth to mouth thing that was, you know, you know, I told you, I told my family, my f people, my friends, everybody's excited. So we feel that this is this is relatively new and it's working very well. It's a very automized process on the website uh, of the Generation Forest Cooperative in Germany. You can become member in a very easy way. You can have a subscription model if you cannot put the 500 euro right away or the 1000 euro right away. So it's uh, I think it's a very interesting initiative that we should all embrace and I'm, I'm you know I'm inviting everybody to look at that and 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 be a member of the cooperative thank you so much um, next question to Kai and Florian um, you mentioned that what one of the aims of the pilot would be to bridge the gap between technology and people also through participatory action research could you please elaborate a little bit more on that I would generally say that I would say that's generally very much in line what you said and on what you said as well. That I think that there are many gaps that need to be bridged. There's probably a gap between the technology entrepreneur and the local person, and I think you mentioned this as well as like there's that notion of essential tech for instance we don't need to look at what's the greatest newest technology but what actually works on the ground so there's a bridge to gap then there i would say there's a bridge to gap between the company or investor in europe or the us who wants to do something for the esg rating or just because they're intrinsically motivated to do so but they are not willing to invest in kenya or in another i mean kenya is not the worst african uh, like the most risky african country by any means but of course there are political risks there are other risks so we need to ask how can we bridge that gap between technology and people how can we bridge that gap between the investors and the countries because those are usually the countries that hold m some of the most precious precious natural assets. Look at Madagascar, Kenya. They're, these are really the landscape we need to be able to protect. And that's, I think, where I would see it from a de-risking point of view. So you can say, how can we minimize those risks and get those investors and channel the money to those regions? I think that's where participatory processes are crucial. The second aspect where they are crucial, I think, is really indigenous knowledge and local knowledge, because we shouldn't be so arrogant to assume that we know what's best for a particular region or tribe or village in whatever Asia or Africa or wherever, that I think there is something we can bring, technology, scientific evidence, because there's there are some common patterns, right? I mean, there are some things we know certain incentives work the same wherever you go. But I also know from my research that some, some things are extremely context specific. And that's where we really need those participatory processes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there any questions from the floor right now? No? Audience? <laughs> there must be something. Please. Um, oh. No, then it's not really recorded, I think, so. Just uh, to this uh, data collecting, um, how do you build trust coming as Big Brother? I, it's a very critical question, I'm sorry about that, but that's the first thing that rings my bell, is like everything has been monitored and you still need to build trust, and I found that a very good question at the beginning. Thank okay. you. To who should I um, give the microphone? To <laughs> or to everyone? Um, to, uh, <laughs> I think I can name Kai. Okay. Yeah. Kai, yeah. I mean, for that, that really means we're having, like you said, we're having a local project team. So we're having Kenyans with a lot of experience in that area, with the network who know the communities and who have been active in that area in that area for a long time. So there is an established network of trust. But then I would say that's also for like the pilot project, my role and the role of my colleagues as the scientists to say there is some scientific credibility. We will do a scientific assessment. What is the impact on nature, but what is also the socioeconomic impact? Will people really profit from that? And there will be a peer-reviewed publication which will say what worked, but also what didn't work. And I think that might be 
if someone is not up for that, I think that's then not the right engagement. But I think we, we should all aim to do that. No project is perfect, most startups will fail, we all know that, but we still want to invest in innovations and some stuff will work, other aspects might not work, but we need to know so we can actually improve it. And, and for me, that's also a way of building trust to say we're transparent about what doesn't work, but we're willing to learn. Thank you. Would you like to yes, add? Yes, if I may add just one thing. I mean, uh, w when you have uh, serious problems somewhere on, on, the, on, the, um, on the planet, many people just uh, think about what can politicians do. The powerful people, they have to change rules. They have to change the things. But in fact, that's not how it works. You need to have street workers who go there, who do the things. And, and this is also a decentralized approach. It's not about centralizing power. It's about decentralizing the things and getting it done. And uh, I mean, politicians always make the things more complicated and not really solve any problem. So we can do it. We have to do it without them. That's my personal opinion. Thank you. Do we have more questions? From the floor? Yes. Oh, no worries. Sorry, I, I joined late, so I might have missed this. But uh, what are the main reasons you've seen for uh, projects failing, community driven projects? That's a good question for everyone. <laughs> so, who wants to start? Quite easy. I've I've been in this field for over 35 years. I've been a country director for many international NGOs, and it's a question that the failure rate is because, well, we're from the outside coming in, looking in, trying to fit into something that we don't understand. In India, you would never get a foreigner to come inside India to become the country director of a organization, because we have enough professional staff in India to be able to do that. But in Africa, for example, we have constantly people coming in for two to three years on turn to do something that is impossible for, for them to know. Usually they have experience maybe of the you know, country, not much of the language, not, not much of the local language, of the customs, the different things. So most projects really fail because the management structure of these international organizations are quite poor. Yeah, they don't have real people. And I've been advocating that all country directors for every African country should be from the country itself. Yeah, so when I left my last post as country director for Angola, I told them, hire the country director who's been vice country director for 14 years waiting to get that position because there's no reason for bringing people in who have no idea about the country. Just because they have an education from a master's degree or a PhD doesn't make them qualified. Yeah? And doing projects on the ground uh, with local people, you should be there. Yeah? It's a very Indian way of doing things. Yeah? We don't, in, in India we have the social movements. Right? We have people actually caring about the environment about things locally, which is instilled in us from very childhood. Uh, we have a whole system of this in India. Unfortunately, in Africa, we didn't have this civil society being built up because we had a, such a colonialism that everybody was told that we're stupid. Mm -hmm. uh, they could never get to that educated state. Oh, we can't have a black leader of an international NGO because his family might be corrupt. So you're saying that a white person in Switzerland shouldn't become a CEO of a company because he might employ his brother. Yeah. These are the kind of mentalities that we are facing with, and it's a very colonialist mentality. So the idea <laughs> is that employ local people, let them become leaders in that organization, let them run the project, no, there's plenty of educated people. Yeah. Stop putting yourself in, um, stop being the nice social worker, Get out of the way, let local people manage. That's what I'm saying. Thank you. Maybe just one short addition, more from a research perspective or maybe a more general perspective. 
I would say it's also over reliance on funding project through development aid or donations, so philanthropic money, but a lack of sustainable business models. I don't want to generalize at all, but I think that is often an issue because then, I mean, now we have a downturn in the stock market who knows what happens to philanthropic money. There might be severe cuts. We know the UK is cutting its development aid by I think f stunning 50% or so. So I think that's something where we should really also push for there to be sustainable business models, not saying this must be just private sector money alone, but definitely also become more resilient, diversify more. This is a point where, where I can add an example. There are so many villages, for example, in Mali, where you have a diesel generator, but never ever one, one kilowatt hour was produced because the diesel became too expensive suddenly, and there was no operator who was able to uh, to repair the system, but money came in. So the, these kind of programs where you just put uh, put money into a country or where you just put uh, systems there, don't work. You have to stay there, you have to operate the systems, you have to be close to the people. Another thing is quite important. It's not about donations. It's about uh, dealing with the people on an eye level. Saying, you want my energy or my service, you have to pay for it. This is This is eye level. And not like I give it to, to for uh, for you to, to, to you for free. This is not business. And if we really want them to uh, to become entrepreneurs, they have to know what it means to deal on the same level. Right. Thank you, Kosti. Yes. Quickly, I don't know if we will have a lot of time, but um, I agree with that. That was uh, said already, and I think what we have noticed over the last twenty years is that, uh, despite the fact that in a lot of areas that you can definitely not build a, an economic model out of a venture, out of an initiative. Philanthropic money has been catalytic. But I think that the new role, as we impact investors, impact experts are, would expect from philanthropic money is to work as, a, uh, as catalytic capital to be able to advance sustainable for-profit models. And the reason for that is that, yes, we have destroyed also a little bit the mentality with this philanthropic money in the developing world countries. Um, a lot of people think there is, the, they think on the average poor person in the developing world that are meaningless. They're not necessarily meaningless. They have low incomes, but they're not meaningless. So we need to provide them with some options that can be affordable for them over time, and at the same time, they can value what you're giving them, a service, a product, um, uh, a job. And the educational part is very important. We have to say that, and this is probably also another area where we can uh, leverage philanthropic money, education, and that can have a larger impact. But I, I agree with what I said already, and and I think we should change. The public-private kind of collaboration hasn't worked already well. There are efforts. I think uh, we could do so much more to, to scale. We said, we talk, we, all of us, we talked about scale, and I think that we can, uh, we can do that this way. Thank you all very much. I think this is a very nice way to close in terms of uh, keeping in mind the mistakes of past development cooperation in terms of creating codependencies and make sure they're not repeated when we do work in restoration, conservation, and so on. So thank you all very much. Thank you. Um, this is a wrap for the Explore.Land project stage at the NOAA Conference Zurich. We are incredibly honored and humbled to be able to gather this amazing lineup of, of projects. Um, it has been really a fascinating process for us as well. So our first thanks goes to all of you, all of the projects that do the hard work on the ground. We sit in our, own, in our home office, so it's not that hard for us. So we're really, really grateful for all of you. Thank you so much. Um,